before, where we know that we're going to get another awesome, inspiring, and uplifting message. But of course, we'll get an assignment that we will all do faithfully. I'd like to ask you to help me welcome to the podium our pastor, our spiritual leader, our very own Reverend John Scott, the beloved. Reverend John. Thank you, Jen, and good morning, spiritual family all across the globe and those in the sanctuary with us. What a lovely morning it is. What a wonderful, wonderful day. The late Maya Angelou said, and I quote, this is a wonderful day. I have never seen this one before. Can we all say that together? This is a wonderful day. I have never seen this one before. So we're going to make the most of it. You ever wake up in the morning um, with a, a, a melody, a song, in your heart, in your mind, and it, it kind of stays with you all morning and through the day? Sometimes you only know maybe one line, but it goes over and over and over in your consciousness. Well, a few Christmases ago, Christmas season, I had uh, the blessing of a baby, an infant to do, one Sunday morning, early in December like this. And I woke up with a carol that I simply love, just with repeating itself. Self. Do you hear what I hear? It's something that, it's a carol that I love. And so I came and I did the blessing. And those of you that know me well, well know that children have a very special place in my heart. Uh, and the blessing of children is, is for me a transformative event. It, it touches me very deeply. I, I don't know, when you hold an infant in your arms and they look into your eyes, they seem to be looking into your very soul, don't they? They seem to be saying, do you know what I know? Or perhaps in the words of the English romantic poem, Poet William Wordsworth, but trailing clouds of glory do they come from God who is their home. Heaven lies about us in our infancy. So this whole thing of, I don't know anybody who doesn't melt when they hold a child in their arms. And so I did the blessing and all through the ceremony and again on my way home, in my mind I'm humming. Do you hear what I hear? Do you know what I know? I get home and going through my emails, you, would you know it? There is an email from Census of Spiritual Living uh, Minister, uh, Reverend Dr. David Ault, who used to be at the Atlanta Center for Spiritual Living. And in that email, he shares with his, his readers the metaphysical interpretation of what, Carol? Do you hear? what I hear. And in his interpretation, he points out that, you know, most of us think of carols as very old melodies, and most of us know them, um, if not all of them, in part. You know, we've been singing them from we were very, very young. We have grown upon them, those of us that grew up in Christian uh, families and Christ Christian communities. And it really is something that we think of as being always there. But there is a carol, and it is, do you, do you hear what I hear, which is only as old as Jamaica is as a nation. It was commissioned in 1962. And here is something else which has potentially earth-shattering 
implications, but had potentially earth-shattering implications for the world. Also in 1962, in October of that year, the Soviet Union and America were involved in a crisis centered on missiles which the Russians had installed in Cuba. So for 13 days during 1962, the world held its breath as the two powers faced off against each other, you know. If you think about Sefe in Jamaica, we say, you know, when you're at school and a bigger boy or a bigger girl than you want to put fight, and the rest of the children are saying, if you think you're bad, Sefe. So America and Cuba were a Sefe to each other, which means I dare you. And in the midst of all of that, now just listen to the way the universe works. A French-born writer named Noel Regne and his American-born pianist wife, Gloria Cheyenne, were commissioned by a record producer to write a carol. In the middle of this face-off, the Cuban Missile Crisis, as it was known, Noel Regne and his his wife, uh, Gloria, are commissioned to write a carol. But of course, they are reluctant. What is the point? They feel that Christmas has already become too commercialized. Imagine that, too commercialized as in 1962, eh? I wonder what they would say about 2021. <laughs> anyway, as we science of mind students know, the universe has exquisite ways of orchestrating life, doesn't it? It seems to point us down the pathway that we need. And since we we are co-creators with God. We know that we also participate in this, in this creation of the path that we need to take for our own growth, our own unfoldment, our own evolution into the greatest us that we can be. And so, this is how the universe works. It is just as mystical as a star shining in the night. We have a songwriter, and of all the names that he would have been christened, it was Noel. Go figure. And guess what? Here's another amazing synchronicity. Himself and his wife have one only girl picnic, and her name is Gabrielle. A child named Gabriel born to Noel and his wife. And so, Reverend Old shares the story that Noel is depressed by the grim faces of people he passes on the street of Manhattan. And I know, I know many people who get very down at Christmas time. There's, I'm a Christmas person. And so you have one set of people that just love it and do it all of the trippings. And you have some people who feel really out of it and down and gloomy. Well, at this time during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, it wasn't a very happy uh, energy surrounding Noel, his wife, and family. Uh, where they lived in Manhattan. No one is smiling, and everyone is uptight because joy seems to have faded as people's lives are overshadowed, overshadowed by the mushroom-shaped threat of total annihilation. And they want me to write a character. He muses, what's the use? We may all be dead tomorrow. 
And then something as miraculous as the energy that arose that first Christmas takes hold of Noel Regney. He's walking down the streets in Manhattan and he passes two mothers pushing babies in their strollers. And you know, there is nothing to soften your heart like a baby. It's just amazing. And I used to, when I first went to England, I used to be very amused. I went at around about this time of year too because the mothers would leave the prams outside the meat shop with the baby all covered up and snugly the little faces, you know, all snug, and going, in, and going to the meat shop with the little dog in their arms. <laughs> and I used to say, look at that now. But when Noel Regne saw these two infants in their mother's care, an inspiration came upon him. And musicians and songwriters and composers have said to me that sometimes the whole thing comes full orbed into their consciousness. It's like they get it. And this entire beautiful song, which I'm sure you know, this simple melody, this beautiful song, comes full orbed into his consciousness. And it begins with the night wind. You know, this time of year, we in Jamaica say Christmas breeze are blow. And we just sang, O'er our blue mountain descends this bright angel song. There is this kind of energy shift at this time of year. And o'er the blue mountain, and o'er the streets of Manhattan, and o'er all of mankind, there comes this shift in energy. And the night wind asks the little lamb, do you see what I see? I just think this is a very important and moving aspect of this song. Because, you know, all of nature seems to know long ahead of us, humans in our arrogance, when something momentous is about to happen. And so the night wind says to this symbol of purity, a lamb, do you see what I see? As David Ault puts it, and I quote, it's kind of like a leg bones attached attached to the knee bone sort of song, unquote. So, so it starts with the most fundamental and pure aspect of life, nature in all its purity, talking to a little lamb, which is a universal symbol of goodness and love and joy. So you know, my friends, nature isn't concerned about missile crises or any other crises, either international or personal. So I have a friend who had located from America back to Jamaica, to relocated. And one half of him, his heart was happy to be home, but he was trying to open a bank account and he had the biggest hassle to do so. And so we sat in our garden and halfway through a bottle of Merlot, he was still bemoaning how hard it is to come a yard. And as we sat in my garden, the same garden that I do, quiet moments in in the morning, this was in the late evening and the, there was this cool breeze wafting over our blue mountain, the neighbor's cat, an ordinary common or garden puss, and uh, disdainfully passed us through my ferns and my, uh, my flowers. And I just thought to myself, look at that. Nature is not concerned with the minutiae and the, the nenge nenge, as we say, that we do to ourselves particularly at this time of year. You know, we, there's so much to do. There are cakes to bake and there is shopping to be done and there are presents to be bought. And what are we doing about the house? And, you know, from when I ask you to hang on back the kitchen door that I hang off on one hinge, all of that is, um, we are saying to our partners and our loved ones. We're in this frenzy. 
while the breeze blows o'er our blue mountain and nature prepares for something so glorious, so beautiful, so tender, that if we could only but just pause for a minute to see, as the wind says, the night lamb to the night lamb, do you see what I see? Do you see the star of astral wisdom that is leading us to the discovery of the Christ in our neighbors, in our friends, in people of different languages and different cultures and different behavior. Do you see that star of wisdom and spiritual perception and spiritual discernment that is urging us to look for the goodness in all of life? And so the night wind says to this little creature, do you see what I see? Wow, I wonder if, we, if, if, if the, the night wind asked us what our response would be. Do you see goodness or do you see ugliness? Do you see beauty? Do you see kindness? Do you see joy? And do you see how that star illumines the darkness of human ignorance and superstition and how it dances above the earthly frustrations with a tail as big as a kite? And this is a little message for our young people in our Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living community. And I know that this doesn't happen anymore to any great extent. But I'll sh share an experience I had when I was 15. My favorite uncle made my brother, Dennis, who is four years older than I, and myself, kites for Christmas. Mine was particularly beautiful. He had used the, the rib from the palm, from the, the, the fronds of the coconut palm to make the frame. And mine was covered in red, green, and gold tissue paper. It was beautiful. And for the tail, he cut up a, 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 one or two of his ties. And my mother, when she saw it, said, but Larry, that is the tie I gave you last Christmas. And he said, it's going flying today. And so he took us to what was known as Racecourse in Kingston. It's now got a, a very stush name, National Heroes Park. But it was Racecourse, covered in, in buttercups and wide open spaces. And people used to go down there and fly kites. And we had a glorious afternoon of flying kites. And then we came home, and we had dinner. And my brother, who remember, he's 19 and I'm 15, is going out to a party, to which I wasn't invited, of course. And I murmured and groaned and, and quarreled to myself mostly, but, but audibly enough to be heard by my parents, why it is I was so restricted. Not fair, I'm only, I'm only four years younger than Dennis, and there's no reason why I can't go out and party as well. And so my father, who was kind of a, a homegrown philosopher, came into my bedroom at bedtime and said, I have a story to tell you. And I thought, oh, God, no. And he said, oh, it's OK. We were flying kites today. And this is a story about a kite in China. Now, one never knew with my dad whether he just made it up on the spur of the moment to, give, to teach you a lesson or whether it actually was a story. So some may get it, some may get it. According to the story, there was this beautiful kite it was larger and more beautiful than any of the other kites that were flown uh, in the kite competitions of its time. And it not only flew faster, it flew higher. But in spite of its, its greatness and its celebrity, it just 
wasn't satisfied. When it reached the end of the string, it could still look up and see the clouds wafting over the mountains and the birds at play among the clouds, and it wanted to go higher. But darn it, the string. The string prevented it from going as high as it thought it should and could go, and it complained bitterly about the string that restrained it. It complained every time the kite went out for a flight about the string, and the string got fed up of it. You know, when you just get tired of being blamed, you mothers, I think, would relate to this. No matter what you do, there's always something more to be done and another complaint about what hasn't happened. And so one afternoon, as the kite was flying, a gale blew up. It was very strong. And normally, the string would hold on for dear life and keep the kite safe. And this day, the kite just let go. So my dad said to me, and what do you think happened? And I said, well, the kite soared up into the clouds to, to fly in the heavens and to, to play with the birds. And my father said, wrong. It's the tension created by the string that creates a dynamic which allows the kite to fly. And so when the string broke, contrary to what I thought, and the, the, the kite had anticipated, it very quickly crashed to the ground, breaking a rib. Hmm. There is a moral to this story. You know, my friends, sometimes when we struggle against what we think are the restrictions, We need to remember that sometimes we ourselves have created that tension in order for us to learn a lesson that is important for our growth so that we can soar to our spiritual magnificence. So the kite wanted one of those no strings attached relationships, you know those? But sometimes there are strings necessarily attached which we need for our own growth so that we too can soar. And it's the things that you think are holding you back that, that may actually be responsible for your growth. Just remember that. And so back to the story of this wonderful carol, do you hear what I hear? The mystery of that first Christmas begins with something as elemental as a cool breeze wafting o'er our blue mountain, the kind of breeze that is perfect for kite flying. And as those gentle breezes blow, nature asks the purity of the animal kingdom to see what we so often miss because we are caught up with the struggle against what we th think is restraining us what is holding us back, when really what we are struggling again against is grooming us for greatness and for goodness and for recognizing and attaining and achieving our worth. So the communication, my friends, moves up the next rung of the upward spiraling ladder of life to a creature the little lamb trusted to nurture and look after it. And the little lamb says to a shepherd boy, 
or it could be a girl because we believe in gender equality. The little, the, Little lamb asks the shepherd boy, do you hear what I hear? Shh, listen. Do you hear? Can you hear above the clamor of daily life, the din of making life work, the honking of taxi drivers, the roar of motorbikes, the blare of sound systems, can you hear this voice, the voice of the infinite invisible, the voice of the almighty I am, saying, I created you to complete me. God said, I wouldn't be complete without each one of you. You come to make me experience life at your level and in your beauty and in your truth. What a glorious, glorious thought for us to have this Christmas time. Do you hear what I hear? Can you hear above the, the clamor of life the truth of your own Christhood, the universal vibration of divine love that will heal everything in your life, everything in the world. Do you hear, echoed what Jesus the beautiful said, love one another, love one another, don't just love one, honor one another as I have loved you. And so the first two questions, my friend, are can you see beyond your human limitations and can you hear the truth in your heart? A truth so life transforming that it has a voice as big as the sea. Listen, my friends, you have to listen amid the clamor. The song of creation, the song high above the trees, with a voice as big as the sea. So as we say in Jamaica, big things are gone. Our shepherd boy or girl needs to share his or her conviction about something that is momentous, something that is life altering, something that is really important. And so he goes directly to the top. He doesn't bother to waste time sharing with his parents or his teacher or some other adult. You know why? Too often, we don't take the time to listen to our young people. Or if we do, we pour cold water on their ideas. Mm -hmm, I hear you. But what? You, you think I'm made of money? You know, say, I can't even open a bank account. You don't tell the bank how much you're up on my head. And you want to start a business at this This time, and you're only 15, what kind of business can a 15-year-old run? We do it, eh? So, he doesn't bother to go where he knows his ideas and this amazing discovery. You know, last Sunday, Carol Campbell shared a reenactment and a Jamaicanization of that wonderful miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And you know, that little boy was saying to his mother, Mama, I was on my way home and I meet this amazing person that, that gave me the truth. And she said, where the, the, the fish and the bread, the sugar bowl may send you for a boy. We do it, eh? So our simple shepherd, custodian of innocence and grace, goes where? To the top of the ladder, the mighty king. And that, my friend, is where we have to go when we have something in our heart so big, when we have a dream that is so incredible. Don't bother tell it to 
somebody who's going to say to you, what? No, sir. Go to the top, to the king that indwells you and me and all creation, the head of the stream. And the shepherd boy says to the mighty king, do you know what I? I'm only 15, but you know what I know? Hmm. A child, a little picnic, is shivering in the cold. And what he is saying across the centuries to you and I is, do you know as you sit in your gated community, in your apartment with your friends, comfortable and warm, that there are homeless people in the streets? There are children and women and people who are being abused and who are lonely. Do you know what I know? That an ounce of love from you, an ounce of compassion, would be silver and gold to those people whom society has perhaps ignored or forgotten. Do you know what I know? That each child comes trailing clouds of glory from God, which is our home, and that heaven lies about us. If we can do what the mighty Jesus said, repent, which means turn around, turn full circle. And become as little children if you want to experience the kingdom, which I have renamed the kingdom of heaven. Let us offer our inner child, the Christ child within us, the silver and gold of our devotion this Christmas. So as Reverend David Ault puts it, and I quote, we do not have the luxury of even one negative thought. We can't afford to hang on to the negatives, for when we do, we are preventing ourselves from accessing the truth, unquote. And so our innocent, pure child self is saying to the mighty king part of us, the higher self of ourselves, we have to humble ourselves and become like little children. In other words, we have to turn back and seek the purity of the Christ child that is within us. And boy, must have said something that touched that mighty ego self of the great king. Because the king is so moved by what the child says that he decrees to the people everywhere, listen to what I say. Said the night wind to the little lamb Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb Do you see what I see? A star, a star, dancing in the night with a tail as big as a kite, with a tail as big as a kite, said the little lamb to the shepherd boy. Do you hear what I hear ringing through the sky? I shepherd boy. Do you hear what I hear? A song. A song high above the trees with the voice as big as a sea, 
with a voice as big as the sea. Said the shepherd boy to the mighty king, do you know what I know? In your palace, war mighty king, do you know what I know? A child, a child, shivers in the cold, let us bring him silver and gold, let us bring Bring him silver and gold. Said the king to the people everywhere. Listen to what I say. Pray for peace, people everywhere. Listen to what I say. Whoa, the child, the child, sleeping in the night, he will bring us goodness and light. He will bring us goodness and love. And Avel, with your voice as big as the sea, that beautiful voice this morning has brought us goodness and delight. Wow, my friends. I believe it is that childlike purity that convinces the powerful side of us that we are indeed beloved of God, that we are heirs with Christ to that kingdom, the family dom of heaven that we share right here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living and that we have come to earth like that little Christ baby to share with all humankind. You know, our every, every day a Christmas luncheon last Friday was not only food for the body, it was food for the soul. And it came beautifully packaged with an affirmation card created by one of our shepherd boys. 13-year-old Ibo Dehaney, and I have to share it with you. It's a little green card, green and red, created by Ibo, and on it is the following affirmation. Christ is born anew in me every day. Can we say that together? Christ is born anew in me every day. I live peacefully, joyfully, and lovingly together. I live peacefully, joyfully, and lovingly. 
Every day is Christmas to me. Every day a Christmas to me. Let us say it in Jamaican. Every day a Christmas to me. Every day a Christmas to me. For real. And so my friends, thank you, Ibo. We do know what you know. And we commit to living it with childlike faith as we go forward into this season of joy and into the new year. Which brings me to your assignment. Everyone who checks out the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living knows I always give an assignment. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it is first of all to make your life a prayer of peace this Christmas whatever else you don't get done whatever else that you have to do that you are worried about and concerned about about. Make your life a prayer of peace this Christmas by making a conscious effort to speak words of harmony and goodwill to everyone you encounter. And it doesn't have to be audible. Sometimes it can be in the traffic and it is the taxi drivers honking behind you when the light hasn't really quite turned to green. It can be your neighbor whose music is too loud or the electric drill is stopping you from listening to your Sunday morning live stream from the temple. And just say in your heart, I behold the Christ in you. Just, just, just the most wonderful gift that you can give to anyone is in your heart. Just look at them and say, I behold the Christ in you. I see in you that tender innocent baby that trailing clouds of glory comes from God because heaven lies about each of us when we seek that little child in the cradle of our hearts in the temple of our lives and bless the world with the gift of our love our compassion and our beingness upon the earth. And so, my friends, I behold the Christ in you. Listen to what I say. God loves you, and so do I. Namaste. Reverend John, thank you so much for that. Let us give him another round of applause, really. <laughs> yes, friends, this morning's message truly is one that has given us a lot of food for thought. As Reverend John invited us to, and I'll give you the three takeaways that we got. He says, can you see beyond your limitations? Can you hear the universal Christhood calling to you? And do you know that there are persons around us with whom we can share this gift this Christmas? So my friends, let us offer the Christ child within that will bring us goodness and light and make sure that you make your life a prayer